In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord bless us, Amen. Glory to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and forevermore, Amen. O Lord, make us worthy to pray, thankfully, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Lord, be thou on earth as in heaven, and give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses. As we give those trespasses against us, lead us, Lord, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Jesus Christ, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forevermore, Amen. Let us give thanks to the gracious and merciful God, the Father of our Lord, God, and the Savior, Jesus Christ. For his protector is to preserve and accept us, had compassion upon us, support us, and brought us in this hour. Let us also ask him, the mighty God, to keep us peace, blessed day and all days of our life. O Lord, Master, Almighty God, the Father of our Lord, God, and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you on every occasion, every condition for all things. We have protected us, sister, preserved and accepted us, had compassion upon us, support us, and brought us in this hour. Therefore, we ask and appeal to the goodness of the Lord of mankind, that you gain to conclude this blessed day and all days of our life. Peace in your fear. All envy, all temptation, or of Satan, rising up with enemies seen and unseen, to cast away from us and from all people from the solid place, granted the damage of our factions, as you give us the authority to triumph of serpents and scorpions, and of all the power of the enemy. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The grace, mercy, love of mankind, even the begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, glory, honor, dominion, and worship are due to you, to go with him the life giving, cause of stage, Holy Spirit, and add for a prime. Amen. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to loving kindness, according to the multitude of tender mercies. Blood of my transgressions, wash me thoroughly for my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sins ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and not see in your sight. You may be found just when you speak and blame when you judge. Behold, those were false and iniquity and sin and will conceive me. Behold, desire the truth in your own part and in your part and make the new wisdom. Purge with his spirit, I shall be clean. Wash me, I shall be white in the snow. Make me tea, joy, and to the boys, you break and rejoice. Hide your face from instance and the blood of all my iniquities. Create a meekly heart of God and your steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, throughout the Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me the generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors away as soon as you be converted to you. Then it be the blood goodness of God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue is glad of righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. Give the Lord's eye sacrifice, or also to give it. Give the Lord the light burnt offering, sacrifice of God or a broken spirit. Work in a contract heart, these are God, you not spies. Sign, build the walls of Jerusalem, then you shall please the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. Alleluia. Prepare the eleventh hour of the blessed days of the Christ, my King, and my God, beseeching him to forgive my many sins from, from the Psalms of our teacher. Favor the prophet and king, may his blessings be with us all. Amen. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous reach out their hands to iniquity, to good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. As for such as turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them away with the workers of iniquity. Peace be upon Israel. Alleluia. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. And they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Alleluia. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. 
like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Alleluia. Maria, the Holy Gospel according to Saint Luke. May his blessings be with us all. Amen. Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever, and they made a request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever and left her. And immediately she arose and served them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had anyone sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak. For they knew that he was the Christ. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Ten osh te moko be Christos nem pe kyo ten agathos nem pe ep nem mai tho ek je akton kek soti em mo nai na a. If the righteous one is scarcely saved, where shall I this be? Because of my human weakness, I cannot bear the burden and the heat of the day. But you, the merciful God, count me among those of the eleventh hour. In sin my brother conceived and gave birth to me. I should not dare look up to heaven, but because of your great mercy and love to humanity, I call to you, saying, Lord, forgive my sins and have mercy upon me. Look, Take me now, my Saviour, into your fatherly embrace, because I have spent my life in pleasures and desires. My time is running out, now a dependent reach and infinite compassion. Do not disregard or humble heart who needs your mercy. I cry to you with reverence, I have sinned against you and against heaven. I am no longer fit to be called your son, treat me as one of your hired workers. I practiced evil with diligence and enthusiasm. With earnestness and keenness, I committed each sin. For this, I deserve suffering and condemnation. Our Lady Virgin Mary, guide me to the means of repentance. To you, I plea through my sixth supplication. I call you for help, lest I fail. Come to my rescue, my soul, the past from my body. The fifth conspiracy of the enemy, trusted as a low, let us support my soul. My Lord, hear us and have mercy upon us. Kiria lay son, Kiria lay son, Kiria lay son. Kiria lay son, Kiria lay son, Kiria lay son. Kiria lay son, Kiria lay son, Kiria lay son. Kiria lay son, Kiria lay son, Kiria lay son. Kiria lay son, Kiria lay son, Kiria lay son. Kiria lay son, Kiria lay son, Kiria lay son. Kiria lay son, Kiria lay son, Kiria lay son. Kiria lay son, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory and honor. God the Father Almighty, have mercy upon us. Holy Trinity, have mercy upon us. O Lord God of hosts, be with us, forgive our support and our tribulation, verses about you. O God, resolve me, forgive us our sins. Willingly, unwillingly, those committed not only are knowingly, the hidden and the visible, the Lord will give us for the sake of the holy name that is called upon us, and according to your mercy, not to our sins. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not temptation, but deliver us from evil, through Jesus Christ our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forevermore. Amen. Thank you, compassionate Lord, who regains us past this day in peace, and brought us thankfully to the night. So leading the light until sunset, accept this glorification now all for you and send us from temptation of the enemy and defeat all these traps set against us. In this coming night, give us peace without pain or anxiety, fatigue or illusion. So we pass it tonight in peace and chastity and awake and praise to you and pray to you at all times, everywhere, and glorify and praise your name, the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. We just sing the hymn while we're standing. We'll do the Sali Adam for the Feast of Resurrection. Beautiful hymn, guys. <coughs> Let us sing today with a voice of joy For the King of glory, Jesus Christ arose Everyone praises with an incessant voice For God the Word, Jesus Christ arose 
For he is our God, come let us worship him. The Lamb of God, Jesus Christ arose. The Master died in the flesh and was buried. And on the third day, Jesus Christ arose. Emmanuel, the Word, let us praise him. With the angels, Jesus Christ arose. All the seven orders worship him, proclaiming continually, Jesus Christ arose, behold our Father Adam, rejoice and was glad with our Father Abraham, Jesus Christ arose, rejoice, O prophets, for the incomprehensible one, our Lord the Master, Jesus Christ arose, Behold, the apostles saw and rejoiced. They preached to the world, Jesus Christ arose. Those who were carrying the spices, the angel appeared to them, saying, He is not he, Jesus Christ arose. Rejoice, O Virgin Mary, the mother of joy, for truly your Son, Jesus Christ arose. Today let us rejoice and be glad because the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, arose. Look, the wise and John, his beloved, truly have preached, Jesus Christ, arose. Blessed are you, O Christ, the unquenchable light. Come, let us praise him, Jesus Christ, arose. He has saved his people with his arm from the devil, Jesus Christ arose. The true Lamb, let us praise him, our true God, Jesus Christ arose. God us, O our God, from malice, our Master, the Son of God, Jesus Christ arose. Zion and Jerusalem rejoice today with the land of Ephthalia, Jesus Christ arose. We praise and bless him and serve him and worship him, Jesus Christ arose. Son of God, our King, died and was buried, and after three days Jesus Christ arose. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice today, Jesus Christ arose. How to the resurrection and the tomb and the blood which the only begotten shed, Jesus Christ arose. Repose all the souls in the dwelling of joy for the sake of your mother, the Queen, Jesus Christ O oh, oh, who has suffered and trampled death, have mercy upon us, O King of the Ages, Jesus Christ arose. For us, we host the wish and glorify the heaven and earth. O Christ, our good Lord, plains his gracious mercy and compassion. He loves the just and shows mercy to all the sinners among some in the first, and to the death of the sinner of repentance and life, but in soul salvation with the most false coming words. This is our every hour. Ease our lives, guide us act according to commandments. Things for our souls, be found, but it's there our thoughts, cleanse our intentions, see our sickness, give us our sins, deliver us from every evil, grief, and distress. Turn to your whole angel, then we guard and guard them. Today, in the faith and love, you will be saved from glory. You are blessed forevermore. Amen. We ask all these things, O Lord, through the intercessions of your beloved mother, St. Mary, Pepper Corlos, St. Barbara, St. Juliana, St. Ophira, here, so we pray thankfully, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thou will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but rest from evil. Jesus Christ our Lord, for now is the kingdom of the power and the glory forevermore. Amen.
Introduce myself. All right, guys, can we all stop by coming forward? Yep, yeah. Everyone from the back, come forward. Really, we shouldn't be past where Victor and Paula. And Verena, come to the left. This side, guys, gets no love. I don't know why. Yeah, like it's fine, I promise. <laughs> There's no cooties there. Welcome to St. Barbara's on a Sunday night once again. Um, so we were meant to have a workshop and that didn't work out. We were meant to have talks and that didn't work out. So you're stuck with me for maybe half an hour ago. <laughs> um, forgive me for, for the lateness. But I thought we would just talk about the section of um, what we're, what we're going to be um, talking about today in the talk. So what's the... Um, What's the overarching theme wow. for the last few weeks? What have we been talking about? No. <laughs> no, no, no. Just in youth meeting. Like, what theme have we been doing? You can, actually. Commandments, not suggestions. We've been doing it for how many weeks now, Marina? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, yeah. Eight weeks, okay? Eight weeks of, um, of this series. And we split it into two. So commandments, not suggestions. The first sort of four were um, five were um, be whatever, okay? So we had um, content with your wages. We had be anxious for nothing. Be mature in understanding. Be holy in conversation. Be perfect. All of that. And then we started the be not. So be not doubtful. Be not ignorant. And be not conform. Callous. Be not me servants of men. All right. So I, I wasn't sure actually where this came from. So um, I looked it up and it's actually 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But I thought we would read just the section and we, we'll try not take too much from, from there so that we can enjoy the talk as well. I thought we'd just talk about it, we'd just read it and then you guys can tell me. Like, just start a discussion a little bit and then we can um, we get into the talk. Um, all right, so it's from um, 17 to 23, I believe. Um, well, let's read it together. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordained in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while, is, while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. So, very nice. Okay, it was a very, very nice um, uh, passage. What do we think? Before I say what, what I think, what do you guys think? What do you think of that, of that passage? What did you get out of it? 
Yes, Bobby. Mm. Yep, yep. Yep. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, when, when God t um, calls you, he equips you with everything you need. You don't need anything else from men. Um, and therefore, don't be slaves of that. Okay? You're free. So don't be, um, yeah, uh, don't become slaves of men. Yeah, very good. Anyone else? Speak. Mm. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. So it's so a big changes. Okay, so when God calls you, that's a huge change already. You don't need anything else from from anyone else. Hundred percent. Yeah. What else? No one else. All right. I really like just the part right before "Do not become slaves of men" is that you were bought at a price. Okay, we just finished Passion Week, okay, and Resurrection, okay, and we saw the price that was paid, okay, we read the price that was paid, we paid attention, like, it's, it's such a costly price, okay, to take that cost and then become slaves of men, what, what, what St. Paul here is trying to say, I think, is that it, you're, you're trying to, like what Paul was saying, you're trying to bring something from the outside into the calling that Christ called you for. So Christ called you as a, um, as a slave or as a free man or as circumcised or as uncircumcised. If you worry about, oh, I'm circumcised or I'm uncircumcised, I have to be circumcised or I have to be uncircumcised, you're bringing a fleshly thing into the, um, into the calling that God has called you, the spiritual calling that God has called you. And so I think that's where the contradiction um, lies. And that's why... St. Paul clearly says, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Don't worry about what men want and argue about circumcised and uncircumcised and all the rest. You were bought at a price. God has equipped you with everything that you need. You don't need anything more. Um, and that should be. Yeah? All right. So today, guys, we're blessed with um, Ayad al-Magdi is talking to us about uh, what we have been just discussing. Um, do not be me servants of men. We've got one more topic in this um, commandments not suggestions series. Um, it's do not be unwise about God's will. That's next week. And then we'll talk to you guys about the new theme um, soon. It's a very exciting theme. So let's make Adi feel very welcome. Son and the Holy Spirit, we got him in. Um, so, like Bishop saying, the topic for tonight is um, comes from the passage in First Corinthians chapter seven, and it talks about um, not being slaves to men. Um, so, this instruction is a little bit different for us today to what it would have been different to the men and women who were living back at the time of Saint Paul's writing, in the sense that, like, slavery now doesn't exist, but back then it did exist, and so. Although the message is slightly different to us today, the, the content of what he was saying differs, but the actual message behind it is the same, which is that either way, whether we're a slave to the evil of this world or a slave to physical men, we're called to be higher than that. We're called to let go of those things and be a slave only to the Lord. Um, and so this topic is a huge, huge, really broad one. Um, we could talk about it all day long. But I thought that just for today, we could focus on three areas where it's very easy to become enslaved to the evil of this world. Um, the first one is being enslaved to the concept of what people think of me. Um, I think that this is probably one of the worst diseases in society at the moment, is being a slave to the thought of what are people thinking of me, or how do I look in front of people, or what's my image in front of people. Um, I don't have social media myself, but I've seen the effect on some of my Sunday school boys, for example, and the impact that it has that 
all that they do is to make their next Instagram post or their Facebook like or whatever. So everything that they do and the way that they act and the silly things that they do from time to time is all because of the image and they want to look good in front of their friends, in front of people. Um, I'll tell you guys a lot of stories tonight. Um, one of these stories is one of my patients at work was a contestant on one of the really famous cooking shows without mentioning the details. And she was uh, a really popular contestant. And I didn't watch this show, but from what I understood, she was really confident and the judges loved her confidence and they loved the way that she could present her dishes and all this kind of stuff. And on TV, she made herself seem like the most confident, successful woman. She was, everybody admired her. She was one of the judges' favorites and so on. The thing is, she was my patient at work, and so I saw her, what she was really like. And she would come in, and she would cry for hours on end, and she would tell me that she's about to film the episode that night, and she's anxious, and she's on a huge dose of anxiety medications. And then I would watch the show because I was trying to support her, and I'd see her completely different image. And nobody else knew the two sides of what was happening. And it made me just realize how many people out there portray these images of being strong, being successful, being happy, being this, and they want the whole world to see this side of them. But deep down, it's a different image altogether. And the world has taught us to become enslaved to this concept of seeming really good in front of people. Like, we have to show them our best. The, the number of mothers who have entered into postnatal depression, because when they look at what their life is like with a baby crying, screaming, nappy changes every five minutes, all that kind of stuff, and then they look at what other mothers are posting on social media, is unbelievable. Sometimes you see these mothers posting these really glamorous photos that have been edited of them holding their babies and everything looks wonderful and so on. And a new mum comes and she sees what the reality is like and it's completely different and she enters into a severe postnatal depression because of what she thinks her life should be like and what it actually is like. And so the world has taught us this concept of being slaved to making other people think that we are, our life is perfect and everything is good. If you think for a moment of all the celebrities that on surface have everything, you know, good looks, success, money, amazing roles, amazing, they go out and have a concert and there's millions of people at the concert, um, they have all these followers on social media and so on, and then all of a sudden, one day you, you read in the newspaper and you hear that they've committed suicide overnight. And you think, what went wrong? Like, they had everything. And then when they look into it, they realize that they were actually depressed and they were actually empty from inside and so on. But they were so obsessed with this image of showing people that they were happy and successful that they didn't give people a chance to reach out to them. And so this concept of being enslaved to what other people think of me is a real disease in the world. Um, if you take a moment and you stop and think about it, and you stop and think like, what do I do with my insecurities? Do I actually go and seek help? Do I actually confess to my confession father or my servants or my close friends and get their guidance and their prayer and their help? Or instead, do I sit there by covering it up? And not just in a materialistic world, but also in a spiritual sense. Like, sometimes I might be really empty spiritually. Or I might be feeling that my prayer life is non-existent. And so instead of doing the right thing, which is to run to Abuna and to confess and to seek his guidance, what I might do is I might say, okay, I've got to cover up for this, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to serve extra. I'm going to take on an extra service. And I look on paper like I'm doing all these amazing things and changing people's lives, but inside I'm empty. And inside I'm not achieving anything spiritually. And inside my service is useless in the eyes of God because it's just I'm just doing materialistic things. And so the message for us tonight is if I feel in my own life, and I say this to myself because for me it's my biggest trigger to know when it's time for me to confess, where I start to think I, I need to show a good image or I'm worried that I'm not showing a good image, this should be a trigger for us that it's time to confess because it doesn't matter what we look like on the outside. What it matters is what we look like before God. And so if I find myself very concerned with what people think or what people have said about me or how I look or whatever, I know it's time to run to Abuna to confess and to start afresh. And so one of the, the first horrible thing that we can be enslaved to in this world 
is to be enslaved to the concept of worrying of what other people think. And so the solution for us, like what is a solution? The highest level of solution to this problem is to do what the saints did, which is not achievable for the vast majority of us, but it's something that we can aspire to. And that is the stories of people like Abuna Abd al-Masih or Abuna Yostos or any of these saints who were known as holy fools. In other words, they made themselves look like fools or crazy or whatever so the, for the sake of destroying the image. You know, there's a very famous saint. Um, I think it was Saint Anastasia, I might be wrong. And I think she was known to be so beautiful that she used to get a lot of compliments about her physical beauty and it disturbed her to the point where she went and she threw herself into a filthy kind of a lake and sat there for hours and hours and hours until her skin started to peel and she did, lost some of her beauty temporarily. And that was how she used to sort of defend herself from these thoughts of being obsessed with what people thought of her. Obviously not all of us can do that. Most of us will never reach that stage where we totally disregard our image, like Abuna Yostos or Abuna Abdul or any of these famous saints. So for us it's un maybe unachievable. But what is achievable is for us to learn to give the glory to others, that when we're praised, we push the glory to somebody else. I have a good friend who uh, a couple of years ago was traveling to China. And you know that in China, it's illegal to preach the gospel there. Um, you get thrown into jail. And so the day before he was flying overseas, uh, he called me and he said, can I send you something to print? I said, sure. When I printed it, it was John chapter 6 in Chinese. Um, the, the entire chapter in Chinese. So I asked him, what are you doing with this? And he said, oh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to print it and I'm going to photocopy it and I'm going to go and put it in random places like the hotel, the bus, the train, whatever, so that people will, will read it and they'll be touched and they'll learn about the gospel. Like an incredible vision of somebody whose heart and mind is focused on spreading the gospel. And I very jokingly said to him, okay, I'll do it on one condition, that when I print it, if anybody converts, then I get half the glory before God, like half the reward. And he looked at me totally confused, not faking it, genuinely confused. I said, you can have all the glory, it doesn't matter, like as long as they come to know God. And this is the, the, the image of somebody who doesn't care about his image or his you know, reward in front of people or anything like that. All that he was focused on was that God was preached. That was all. It didn't matter who got the glory or the respect or anything. And so the first solution that we have to our first problem tonight if I'm obsessed with my image in front of people, then let me learn to give the glory to other people, that I don't care if I'm praised or not, the praise can go to somebody else. The second trap that the, trap, that the devil can enslave us with is being enslaved to materialistic things of this world, money, materialism, possessions, and so on. Too often, we get a taste of it, and before we know it, we find ourselves obsessed with it. So we may get a car, and then we're happy with the car for a while. And then all of a sudden, I want a better car and a faster car and a, and a more expensive car. I buy a house and I'm happy with it at first. Before I know it, I find that you know the house feels a bit small. I want to expand. I want to renovate. I want to get a bigger house. I want to move very quickly. These things are not necessarily bad in themselves. But if I become enslaved to them, I become a slave that all I'm thinking about is I, I want to get more money. I want to expand. I want to do this then all of a sudden this temptation has become something that is really enslaving us. Um, I remember hearing a talk once by a very blessed servant in our church, and he was saying that before marriage, the number one temptation is physical temptations of the body. And he was saying that after marriage, the number one temptation is this concept of money and expanding and building and, and getting more and more possessions and so on, providing for my family and so on. And what's really scary about this type being enslaved, is that often it can be presented as something good. It's very easy for us to feel that we're doing something good when we do this, that what I'm doing is I'm trying to provide for my family, or I'm making sure that my kids have a really good future, or I'm making sure that my, my, my wife and my, my children are comfortable and they're not having to work really hard, or they're not having to go out and, and give up things and so on. They don't have to feel like my kids are giving up things compared to their friends. And so it's very easy for us to fall into this sin and think that we're doing something good. It's very easy for us to think, okay, well, I'm working really hard, but I'm donating all this money to charities and 
feeding the poor and doing all these things. So it's okay for me to start working on Sundays and to get more money and so on. And so before we know it, our lives can really spiral out of control. I'll tell you one of the saddest stories that I think of experience in my life. When I was growing up, my brother, my older brother, had a really, really blessed servant. And this servant was so dedicated to the class that it made me and my, my class very jealous that my brother had this amazing servant. Because this servant would pick them up and he would take them out and he always organized all these outings and he knew all what was happening in their life. He would call them if there was a problem. He would spend money on them left, right and center for their birthdays for no reason at all. And so this servant was really known in our church to be a very blessed and dedicated servant and everyone wanted this servant to be their servant. Every year when the allocations run out, we would quickly check and we'd see, is he our servant? No, he was serving my brother's class again. And so we, we loved this servant, even though we didn't have him directly. I remember that one day he got offered a job to work overseas in finance. And he took the job, and initially it was supposed to be a six-month uh, contract where he was going to be working in the stock market in Europe. And unfortunately, while he was there, he fell into the love of money. And it happened that he started to get really, really good at what he was doing. He became one of the highest, uh, you know, my highest authorities in terms of what stocks to buy and which ones to sell and so on. And he became incredibly rich in these six months. And when it was time for the six months to come back, he said, you know, I'll extend it for another six months. And he did. And all of a sudden, instead of being very active in the service in the church in Europe that he had joined, he started to work seven days a week. And before he knew it, he was missing long periods without having Holy Communion, without missing... Eventually, after five or six years, his visa expired and he couldn't get a new visa and everything else. So he came back to Australia and he was a mess. Like, we couldn't recognize him. He was a complete mess. He would walk around and all he was thinking about was going home to go and make more money. And it was really sad to see that this servant who was so dedicated ended up being one of the most money-obsessed people that you'd ever meet in your life. And so what is the solution to this? The solution to this enslavement is to get into the habit of giving away things that are valuable to me for no reason. Like, we all know that the church asks us to tithe 10%, but there's no reason that that has to be all that we do. And if we get into the habit of giving away above and beyond then all of a sudden these possessions don't attract us as much anymore. You know, it would have been very easy for the sinner woman, for example, to say, okay, I'm going to repent, I'm going to collect 10% of all the money that I've made from my sin, and that's enough, and I feel like I've done the right thing. But when she came to repent, her love was irrational. She didn't stop and think, okay, rationally it's 10%, I need this much. No, she took the whole bottle for all that it was worth, broke the flask and poured it all in one go. Because that to her was, I, I'm not obsessed with the things of this world anymore. I can pour it out before God. And so for us, we need to be like the woman with the two mites who gave above and beyond what she was asked to do. And that is the secret, that if I do that, if I give above and beyond without thinking, I don't sit there calculating 10% on the dot and this and that, then it becomes very easy to then just give away and not be obsessed with the things of this world. And the third thing I thought we could quickly touch on tonight, the third way that the devil enslaves us and makes us a slave, is to physical temptations. The desires of the body can be incredibly enslaving for us. And it can be incredibly enslaving and destroying us physically and spiritually. So many marriages have broken down because of physical lusts of adultery or pornography or whatever it is. So many youth have had their lives destroyed in physical and spiritual ways because of the temptations of overindulging in food or alcohol or drugs or physical desires or temptations or whatever it is. Physical temptations are difficult to control because the more that we give in to them, the more that they control us. The more that we give into them, the more that we want to partake of these physical desires. And so the more that we resist them, the easier they become for us to push away. The Bible clearly teaches us, resist the devil and he'll flee from you, he'll run from you. And so it's really important that we don't let these physical temptations take over us. Because once the door is opened, 
It is very difficult to close. You know, during Passion Week, we fast, we do matanyas, we do all these things. We fast, we don't eat. And all of a sudden, after 50 days, we start to eat. And it becomes so hard to get back into the habit of praying, of waking up early to attend masses and so on. And it's the same with physical temptations of sexual nature, where if we're committing an inappropriate sexual sin, it's very difficult once that door is opened to close it. You talk to anybody who um, has come to Christianity from a non-Christian background and has been in a bad relationship, they can give up a lot of things, but the physical desires of their body are so difficult for them to break off. I remember two very sad stories from the monastery. Um, we were at the monastery for a period of time, and it was after we finished HSC, and we were there for, you know, had a couple of months, so we were there for about a month together. And I remember that during that time, we saw two really sad, we saw many th happy things, but two really sad things that happened. The first one was a youth uh, who had come back to the church after a long period of having been in a bad physical relationship, not married, living with a woman. It was just there was lots of things were wrong. For some reason, God touched his heart, and this youth came to stay at the, at the monastery. And his plan was that he was going to stay for as long as he needed to overcome this temptation. And he overcame many things in his life, many things that he'd been doing that were wrong, until this temptation started to strike him again. And unfortunately, as much as the monks tried to convince him, please, don't go back for it, don't go back for it, don't go back for it, he went back um, because he just couldn't resist the temptation. It had enslaved him that much. And we never saw him again, um, unfortunately. And so he was one of the sad stories. The second really sad story was a youth who uh, had been addicted to drugs. And his parents, meaning very well, had sent him to the monastery despite his severe addiction to the, to the drugs. And obviously when you're that addicted to drugs, you need medical intervention. You can't just suddenly stop. You know, it takes a lot of prayer, but it also takes a lot of medical intervention to get somebody off drugs. And his parents, being very simple people, just sent him to the monastery. I thought, you know, just go and, you know, we'll pray and so on. And we watched this guy decline. You know, the first day he was just agitated, but he was okay. The second day he was agitated, but he was getting very snappy. He'd get very angry if, you know, somebody pushed in in front of him in the line or whatever. By the third day, he started to shake. You know, he was really violently shaking. And we were thinking this didn't, didn't look very normal to us that somebody could shake like this. And then by the fourth day, he started to hurt himself. He would bang his head against the wall to the point where it became unsafe. And he himself called a taxi back then, um, you know, where the monastery was. It was, there's no Uber, it's very isolated, whatever. He called a taxi. The taxi quoted him at something crazy, like $800 to come and collect him and take him. And he said, you have to prepay this on the phone because I'm not coming all this way and whatever. And he paid that $800, a taxi rocked up, took him back um, to Sydney. He had become a slave to the drugs. And so what's common in, this, in these two stories is that in both of these stories, both of these young men were genuine in their desire to change, genuine in their desire to break the bonds of sin. But unfortunately, the physical temptations had overwhelmed them and had made them a slave. That they were no longer, when you were a slave, you don't act according to your will. You act according to the will of your master. So you could will to do something in one direction. Your master comes and tells you, do this, and you have to obey. And so these young men had become slaves of their, of their addictions. And so they wanted desperately, desperately, to break off their bonds of their sin. But because they were enslaved to them, they didn't have a choice. And so they were, had to act on their desires. And so this is one of the reasons why the fathers of the church often teach us that it's better to be extreme in these circumstances rather than being lax. And what I mean by that, for example, like I know of youth at our church, for example, who do not want to ever, ever, ever touch alcohol. Or, you know, although the church says that you know, it's a sin to be drunk, it's not necessarily a sin to have a drink here or there, but these youth felt, because of the risk that this drink poses to me, I don't ever want to risk it. I'm not going to touch it. And the same with many other areas in their lives. And sometimes people make fun of them and say, oh, they're extreme or they're old-fashioned or they're backwards or whatever. But in the eyes of God, these people are so careful with their spiritual life that 
They don't want to risk becoming enslaved to something that they may not have control over. And so they don't want to risk it, and so they are extreme in the sense of cutting these things off. Um, it can be a bit depressing if you talk to somebody in the world about trying to break their habits. Like, if you talk to someone in a secular sense about trying to stop alcohol, or stop drugs, or stop smoking, or stop physical temptations, it can be really depressing because they say, well, how am I going to stop? You know, like, I can't help, I'm chemically addicted, I can't, I'll try the medications, it may not work, or whatever. But there is a secret ingredient that we can't really explain, but there is somehow, in a sense, that the Word of God cleanses us. It says that several times in the Bible. You know, if you read, um, if you pray the Midnight Prayer, Psalm 119, the 22 parts, you notice something really fascinating, that in every single part of the 22 parts, it talks about something to do with the word of the Lord, or your word edifies me, or your word cleanses me, or how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word, or something like that. It's something about the word of God, or his commandments, or his statutes, or his laws, in every single section of the 22 parts of the Midnight Prayer. And it says that his word cleanses us. It's almost like by reading it, we are cleaned from whatever it is that we're struggling with. I'll end with one final story of hope. Um, this is a true story that actually happened where a man at our church had a really severe alcohol addiction. And uh, he was advised to talk to Alcohols Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous at AA, who are the organization that help alcoholics recover. And the man on the other line when he rang said to him, do you have a faith? And he said, yes, I'm Christian. And he said to him, which church do you go to? And I said, I, I go to St. Mark's Coptic Church in Arncliff. And he said, okay, what I'm going to do is we're going to have the meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings with you in your church. And he said, okay, that's a bit weird, but sure. And so what would happen is that this man from AA would come and he would sit with this Coptic man and all that they would do was read the Bible for hours on end, two, three, four hours at a time, just reading, reading, reading. He didn't say anything to him at all about alcohol or about you know, giving up or anything like that. He just kept reading and reading and reading. Miraculously, miraculously, this man, after one year, you can ask the priest of our church, they, it's one of the highlights of their priesthood, that after one year of coming to the church and reading the Bible over and over and over again, somehow he just woke up one morning and he had zero desire to taste alcohol. And to this day, this man has never touched alcohol again. It's been four or five years, and it's been a, an incredible miracle. And so there is some mystery, we can't explain it, that the Word of God cleanses us. And the word of, Lord, word of God breaks the addictions. So if I am struggling with something that is enslaving me, that I'm finding it really difficult to break the bonds of, then let me make a promise to the Lord that I will take strength in His Word. That every single day for the next year or next month or whatever it is that you promise with your confession father, I will read whatever my confession father tells me I need to read from the Bible. And may God give us the strength to break the addictions. Glory be to God for every minute. Okay, thanks very much, Adel, for that uh, fantastic talk. A round of applause. Um, for those who um, came in a, a little bit after, um, we, we've actually started, um, we're, we're up to our be nots. So um, Ada just covered be not me servants of men. So we're up to our, we first covered um, a series on the bees and now we're up to our be nots. So if you want to follow up on any of these, you can follow us on, um, on the YouTubes and um, from there, look at all the, the youth meetings from there, but there's just a few announcements we'll cover before we have a photo. So, as always, we have our normal services which run in the church. On Monday nights at 7.45, we have book club. Um, so, last week, we had a lovely barbecue to celebrate the Feast of the Resurrection. Um, and then, God willing, this week for book club, we're starting a new book, which is a case for the resurrection. A lovely book by Lee Strobel. He also did the ca uh, case for Christ. A lovely book we'll be sharing together tomorrow. We'd love to see you all then at 7.45. We also have our Bible study at 7.30 on Wednesday nights. Um, so we're reading the book uh, of Song of Songs. We're up to chapter 7. So we'd love to see you all then at 7.30 on Wednesday. 
Um, we have our liturgies, our weekly liturgies. We have a liturgy on Wednesday uh, from 9 to 11, Friday morning liturgy, which is our working youth liturgy from 5.45 to 7.30. Saturday liturgy from 9 to 11, and Sunday liturgy from 8 to 11. Youth meeting, as we know, from uh, 7 to late. And um, there's a prayer meeting in the church at 9.30 this evening for those who would like to attend. Um, just a few announcements from Christian Aid, which is on Tuesdays. Verena is more than happy to answer any questions um, with Christian Aid. So with Christian Aid, they've just asked that if anyone would like to donate um, any pieces of clothing, either a one-off, weekly, fortnightly, or even monthly, that there's posters outside, posted outside uh, for anyone that would like to donate any, any type of donation. Um, and if you can't find the posters, you can feel free to find Verena. Um, now the food is outside, but just before we jump into the food, we'll, we'll have a nice photo. So those at the back, can you, can you move forward, please? Um, so we can have a photo. Come closer. Yes, yes, coming fast. One second. One last announcement. Um, our youth is uh, doing a monastery trip on Saturday the 20th of May. So the bus is leaving from 7 a.m. with Anthony. So if you want to book, um, there's a poster going around. Anthony is more than happy to take your name down um, for a spot on the bus. But it's Saturday the 20th of the 5th. Alrighty. Thanks all for those who moved. We'll take a nice photo now. Everyone. Anesi He is truly risen Jesus the compassionate Was crucified too Jesus the compassionate Was crucified too Redeem the human race from the fortress of Satan, Anesti, Alithos, Anesti, Christ is risen, He is truly risen, of the three days, while it was dark. After three days, while it was dark, and the people were sleeping, Christ is risen. Anestos, Anesti, Alithos, Anesti, Christ is risen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We give you thanks, O God, for being, gathered, for being gathered together in your holy place, O Lord, this awesome place of yours. We give you thanks, O God, for the love and the fellowship of this meeting, and pray, O God, that it may always flourish. We pray, O God, that you would find us faithful to you and Lord, to you all the days of our lives, that we would never be enslaved to the things of this world, O God, but we would follow your commandments bravely, O Lord, and in all obedience. We pray for the virtues that we need to be able to do that, O God. 
We pray that you would bless us, O Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Saint George, Saint Ophir, the Hermit, and all your heavenly saints and angels. Hear us, Lord, and pray thankfully, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the kingdom come. Give us as they are daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those trespasses against us. Deliver us from evil, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the kingdom, power, and glory, forever and ever. Amen.